Welcome to Geocache Adventures with me, Shadow Dragon One, where I explore the world of geocaching. If you enjoy the show, please consider leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts or on the Geocache Adventures Facebook page. You can also follow Geo Adventures on Buy Me a Coffee for a behind the scenes look on every episode. That's one word G E O Adventures. It's free to follow, or you can become a member and unlock exclusive posts and information. Your memberships go a long way for helping support the podcast and are greatly appreciated. Hi everybody, Amy, Shadow Dragon one here, and with me today is returning guest Kitten Davis. You may remember her from the Human Trackables miniseries, and I also got to recently meet you at MOGA and discover you, which was awesome. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. And today we're going to follow up with that geocaching search and rescue training that you eluded to in the last time you were on. <laughs> well, uh, like I said, you know, before, you know, before somebody had asked me if I'd ever used my search and rescue dogs to find geocaches. And I'm like, oh, yes. Um, in, in search and rescue, um, to even as a, as a, as a, a man tracker or a human search and rescue, you know, we call them, we call them, you know, feet on the ground, um, without a canine, I still use search. I still use geocaching to help me hone my skills in search and rescue as a searcher of a, you know, as a human, a human searching another human, but it's a whole lot easier with the dogs cause they can smell things from far away. <laughs> So tell us a little bit about your search and rescue background before we we get into the geocaching part. How long were you in search and rescue? Um, I started search and rescue back in 2014 um, for as I don't want to say as as a profession because you do not get paid for search and rescue. So if you think you're going to go out and make money being a search and rescue person or a search and rescue canine handler, you you got another, you got, you got something coming because it ain't nothing. Um, you don't do it because, you know, you don't do search and rescue because you get paid for it. It's all volunteer work because I mean, if your son went missing, how much would you give me to go find your kid? Anything. (laughs) Exactly. So, which is why you, there, there is no money in this, but they do, you know, they do require you to have training and they do require you to have hours. Um, so back in 2014, I started in a search and rescue group with a, with a puppy and a canine, a canine a puppy. And, um, I don't want to say started it professionally, but started it for real. But I did grow up in Washington state out on the Olympic peninsula and, oh, probably seven or 8,000 acres of wooded forest was my backyard. Um, you know, so, I mean, from a little kid, you know, I learned how to hunt fish, hike, you know, track, um, my son, he's 24. Now he first started geocaching with us when he was two and a half. Um, it was like the summer that August or September. And, um, he learned, you know, from a little kid, you know, a little baby, he learned how to identify footprints and, and tracks and trails, you know, um, which way do the trails go? Um, most geocachers that hide geocaches, most 99% of the time, they hide them in the easiest, easiest path to take, which is usually a deer trail you know? Yeah. And it gets bigger as people find it. Um, there are some, there are some crazy caches out there that hide them in places that is like, are you kidding me? <laughs> it's like, how do you even get into that? <laughs> I don't even. That's, that's when the terrain gets marked a five and needs a five plus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You just, yeah. You just need to take the chainsaw and cut a door, you know? Um, <laughs> But from a child, as a child, you know, from a little kid be- growing up, up in the, you know, the Olympic Peninsula on the beach and out in the woods, I've always, I've learned how to track, you know, you just, it, it's just been a theme. Um, so when the dogs are with me, um, well, you, you teach them how to find people and you teach them how to find articles because when you're tracking or doing an area search, the dog's 
find anything that has current recent human smell to it okay and you know as as people are lost for a longer period of time the scent goes smaller you know goes weaker um so yeah uh i taught them how to find things that were recently dropped like my car keys finding your finding your car keys is a really good thing to have your dogs do yeah i was just thinking i could use that for finding my phone sometimes around the house uh doesn't work in the house too many things does oh too house. yeah no. good point too many too many articles no nope. with too many human sense no but no but i we live on five and a half acres of wooded land i mean right now i live in illinois we went out uh in the cornfield you know and it's like oh you know i mean corn um we used to live in utah and it had that scrub oak okay you'd go in and you could get in, but you turn around, and try and come back out. It's like gnarly fingers, you know. It's, that stuff rips things off of you all the time. And then all of a sudden, you get back, you get out of the cornfield, or you get out of the scrub oak, and you're like, "Oh, uh, my carabiner got pulled off somewhere." Mm. And you look at the dogs and go, "Article," <laughs> <laughs> and they go back in. And you just, I walk a straight line, and the dogs, you know, you send them off to one way. And then you send them off to the other. And the dogs have bells on them. You know, my dogs have, I only have two dogs right now, but each one has a different bell. The the male, the bigger guy, he's got a dark, a, a, a deeper. Oh, bell tone. so you can tell which dog is. And then the little one okay. has a higher pitched bell tone. So that makes I know sense. which one is where, and I know which way they're going. And when they start not being able to hear them, I call them back. Seek, and then I give them a direction, you know, seek left or seek right or, you know, whatever word you use. Cause some people, some people use German, some people use, I mean, you train them in different languages, you know, just whatever your preference is. Right. But, um, but yeah, when the bell stops, you're like, Hmm, they're over that way somewhere, you know? Um, and it just depends on what, do what dog I'm using at the moment, because my, my cadaver dog, my cadaver dog now is cadaver is like deceased people okay so my cadaver dog she would stop by the bell would stop and then <laughs> her indication was kiss the baby because if the person was on the ground she would lick them in the mouth <laughs> in the mouth oh. of the face because nine times out of ten they weren't deceased they were passed out and licking your getting you know having your oh, face wet it causes a response for right, people right so if your eyes opened up she'd back up and start barking so i knew where she was and then okay. i'd radio in and i'd say hey um my canine is barking so that means they're alive here's my location i'm heading in this direction come come get me you know come get us and send emts um if she didn't bark but her bell you know her bell would like if she found a piece of article or evidence, she'd stop and sit on it or she would come back and tag me. She'd like body slam me and take me back to it or take huh. me back to the victim. Okay. Because okay. I didn't wake up. Well, it works out really, you know, it just depends on which dog you have. You know, my tracking dogs, you know, their tracking dogs are on a leash. So when, you know, when they find an article, they would just stand over the top of it and stare at it until you gave them their reward. Okay. You know, so it all depends. And I have, I have one picture where we were in Utah, we were in Utah and we were heading out to find the baseball diamond out in the middle of the West desert. And it was a five mile hike around the baseball diamond. And then to the pitcher's mound. You'd start at home plate, and you went to first base, and second base, third base, and then back to home, and then you'd had to go out to the pitcher's mound. And um, I took all three of my dogs for that one because I I wanted to make sure that I got to that I got to all of them. And uh, two of them, two of them sat. Well, one sat, one sat and stared at it. The other one, because, you know, the, he, he, was, he was an evidence recovery uh, for narcotics. So he'd sit and he'd stare at the, the sagebrush. And then the other one, 
the other one, she was my tracking dog. So she laid down because it was down low. So she laid down and put her nose right at it. And then the third one was my cadaver dog. She came back and body tagged me and took me back to it. So it was really kind of cool. It was That's really, interesting. Really kind of cool. So that way that, but see, it, it helped geocaching helped with my dog's skills and honing their skills. Um, it also helped with my training because each dog needed four hours of training per discipline. Okay. Oh, wow. So four hours of obedience, four hours of narcotics, four hours of tracking, four hours of article evidence, four hours of whatever, you know, so each one, you know, each one had, you know, and that one, that one kind of got all three of them done all at the same time because it, it made it easy for me to just take all three of them. And then we, we did article evidence recovery. We did um, recalls where I called them back to me, you know, and, and they had to get into a heel or, you know, so um, uh, obedience training, you know, they can't, they can't critter, you know, and when you're out, <laughs> yeah, when you're, when you're out yeah. in the middle of no man's land in the West desert, there's a lot of jackrabbits. So crittering is very, very tempting for the dogs. Yeah, my dogs would not. I've got one dog and he spends most of his time trying to get rabbits and lizards and whatever from under my shed. So how did you get the idea to use geocaching for training the dogs? I mean, by 2014, you'd been geocaching for a while. Because I'm lazy. (laughs) (laughs) every week the dogs have to have four hours of each discipline i got i got my dog training as a handler in okay four hours worth i got the obedience in because they had to do the recall they came back they had to they they did their evidence recovery they um you know i would i would put um I would put the other two in a heel with my husband and put the tracking dog on her lead and I'd have her track to the next, you know, to the next one. Um, yeah, it, oh, it cut my training down by a half, you know, and I used it for a lot of other dogs too. In, in one year, in one year, my last year, 2013 to 14, um, was the last year I was in Utah. I put 32 dogs through my house and wow. donated them out for avalanche recovery um, one's up in Park City. A um, couple of them are down south in Utah, southern Utah. Um, yeah, when you're when you're working that many dogs, and I mean, I used to do little little dogs too. Um, for uh, I t- I'd take the little dogs under under 20 pounds and under or over two years old, and I'd train them for um, companion dogs for the elderly. Oh. Um, you know, I mean, when I go geocaching, the dogs have to stay with me. They stay in a heel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm lazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lazy. Okay. So walk me through what like a training session to get a geocache with a dog is like. I get they're looking for human scent, but how do you get them from start to like, just kind of walk me through how this works. Well, here. you you drive up to an area. Okay, so say that there's a um, let's do a cemetery cache. Let's okay. do a cemetery cache, um, and somebody just found it like yesterday. All right, and there's there's been snow and rain and stuff on the ground, so not very many people have been in the cemetery when it's been snowing or raining or slushy or nasty. Yeah. But, some crazy cashier just went out like a day or two ago and found this cash in, in the cemetery. So I'll, I'll park at the entrance of the cemetery because I kind of know where it's at. So I just get an idea of where it's at. And then I'll get the dogs out. You get them dressed because each dog has a different, uh, different leash, different vest, different harness, whatever. We call it, the, you know, you get them dressed for their, the occasion or the event. Okay. And then... You, I get them out and find out which way the wind's blowing, you know, because you got to have the wind blowing in the dog's face. And if it's not, if it's not really good for the, you know, if it's not blowing directly at us, then I will go along the side to where it's blowing from the side. 
you know, from the left or the right of the dog. And then whatever your, whatever the command word is for your dog. Now, if I did, so I'd always say article. Okay. okay. Because this article for a dog means just find me something that's fresh. Okay. That fresh human scent on it. Article. And so then they would, they would know, you know, I mean, article is find it, find a piece of something or seek would be fine what you know like seek was my cadaver dogs you know and my okay. narcot my narcotics dog command was seek and they knew they were looking for a specific smell like okay or or cadaverin or whatever um and then i take their leash off and let them go and we would start walking across the wind so the wind is blowing from one side or it's either blowing in front of them. If it's if it's blowing towards our face, I would walk from side to side so that the wind was blowing past us. And okay. the dog the dogs actually start doing a zigzag pattern. They start, you know, they'll they'll be doing like a in front of me, they'll be going back and forth in a, in a small zigzag pattern. Well, if you've got, let me see if I got a piece of paper here. Oh, know if you can describe this or not but say at the tips i've got my two my two index fingers together like the church of a steeple right okay say that that article is at the tip of my finger as the wind okay. goes past the scent makes an, a cone this is the co in between my fingers is the cone but it spreads out further and further like this the from from the from the article or the person the wind will push scent but it makes it a cone so it's pinpoint where my fingers are touching but it spreads out further and further and further like this you know apart does this make sense exactly that's a scent cone right there okay i'll yes. put that in the show notes okay so now down at the bottom of this cone down at the bottom mm -hmm. of this cone so this is my cone now. I'm walking this way. I'm, I'm, I'm like walking the dog this way, back and forth, or I'm walking it this way, back and forth, and the wind's blowing this way. And just as soon as the dog hits that scent cone, they go pew, and turn. And so they'll be in the scent cone, and they'll be like, oh, I'm in the scent cone. Then they'll get over here. Whoop, I'm out of the scent cone. Oop, got to come back. Okay, so they go back and forth to narrow down the scent cone. If they leave the scent cone, erp, they come back until they get it. And then they go across, they leave the scent cone, erp, come back until they get it again, until they hit the victim or the article. Oh. And there's my geocache. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. I cheat. <laughs> Well, they never say exactly how you have to find the geocast, just that you have to do it. No, they only say you have to sign the log. Well, that's true. <laughs> you kind of have to find it to sign the log, but yeah. Yeah, that's... but yeah, yeah. Somebody can tell Typically, you. Typically, you at. have to find it to sign the yeah, log, we'll yeah, say. But somebody, somebody can tell you where it's at and you just go get it or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, finding, they didn't say how you had to find it. They didn't say you had to, you know, you couldn't use aids to find the cash <laughs> that's true but like i said i the reason why i started using my dogs is because i am just lazy and with that many dogs with that many dogs in the you know i mean in the beginning when when my son was little there weren't there were hardly any i mean there were no caches i mean we did all the caches in the first six months that were in utah because there was just no caches right um, but i'm from washington state so going back up there was was our events, you know, our main, our main place that we got a bunch of caches through the years. Um, 2014, I started out with one, one dog. And then shortly at like three years after that, I got another dog. And then after I became an instructor, actually I was an adjunct instructor at the police Academy. Um, I started getting, I started taking in the the retired dogs and the difficult dogs and the dogs from breeders that wouldn't sell to the public. Um, if the dog didn't make the cut, then I would take them. 
and I would train them to do something else. They would either do um, avalanche training or uh, search and rescue or cadaver, something just to get them out of the kennels. Oh, and wow. then I would donate them to different departments. Um, like as Hannibal is up in Park City, um, Cinder and Stuka were down in, south, in Southern Utah. Um, and it's just, you know, they, they were all over. I just, I donated them back out um, to different departments. That's awesome. So I know hound dogs, I mean, they're kind of more bred for picking up scent, but can any dog, depending on temperament, of course, can any breed, we'll say, can any breed be trained to do search and rescue? You can train a parrot if you have the patience. <laughs> <laughs> that I'd like to see. I'm not going to lie to you. Not me. That what I'd like to see. I uh, Job did not give me his patience at all. I <laughs> <laughs> so they say that they say that the the longer the muzzle, the the more it's called olfactory. Mm -hmm. The more the snippers yeah. they can smell. And they say that the longer the nose, the more the better because there's more surface for them to smell. Um, I had a Shih Tzu, that poor dog, his nose was so smashed in, um, he'd snort when he breathed. Yeah, I know pugs have a lot of problems yeah. because they're so smashed. Yeah, but there was a guy that had a Rottweiler and... It was funny. Once he cleared the Twinkies out of the room and anything else that was edible, he found the narcotics. So even a dog with a smashed nose can, st I mean, if you make it fun enough for him. Yeah. You know, if you make it fun for him and shoot, I mean, making something fun for the dog to do by finding geocaches is fun for me to do. So we both had a blast. Um you know, when I was training him, my, my first narcotics dog, I was told that he hated doing narcotics. He only liked bite work. They couldn't get him to smell, you know, to sniff out, sniff out drugs if they tried. Um, they were going to euthanize him. And I took him in um, because he had bone spurs in his back. So I oh. took him in. I started doing geocaching with him because I'd already started doing it with, with the other two little ones. And uh, within six years, we became one of the top five narcotics dog handler team. Wow. In the Wasatch front area. I mean, when we, when we certified, we, I was told that I was in the top five, five in my scores, but we didn't discuss it too much because I wasn't an officer. I gotcha. was a volunteer canine handler for the Tooele County Sheriff's Office search and rescue team. So I was an, adjunct instructor but the sergeant came up to me and he says you, you are in the top I'm not going to tell you which one but you're in the top five but I made it fun I mean it was it, it it was a game you know and when you're having fun and your dog's having fun shoot you can't hide from me <laughs> <laughs> you, you might be able to hide from me but you won't be able to hide from my dog <laughs> Oh. I, I can't help but think of that shirt I've seen floating around on Facebook. Don't upset geocachers. We know all the best place to hi hide the bodies. Yeah. And you're the geocacher that can find all the bodies with your dog. <laughs> yes, but I also know 15 ways to bury you and they'll never find you either. <laughs> yeah. We Let's not tick you off. off. <laughs> anyway. How do you pick what geocaches to take your dogs to like it sounds like it's needs to be recently visited or i i took them to everything i i even even the city ones even the ones in town in in the city um you know if i knew if i knew back then we we called them um uh street lights you know the just the street okay. lights we didn't call them lamp post skirts that's that that didn't come along till way you know till later but if i knew if i knew it was something like that or the brick walls oh people that put those little drill those little holes into brick walls oh yeah the little that would drive the the me nanos. crazy so i'd take my dog up to a brick wall and i'd just take my hand and i'd 
run my hand up and down the brick wall and the dog would go up and they'd sniff down and they'd sniff up and they'd sniff down. And just as soon as they smelled something that had human scent on it, they'd, they'd stop and, I mean, if it was up high, they, Jari would stop and stare up or Lunar Dioji, those were the two little black ones in the picture that I showed you. Those two, they would jump because they, they were, they were Kelpies, the cattle dogs. Okay, okay. yeah. They would jump, wee, <laughs> jump. <laughs> so it was up high. So it didn't matter. It's just, it's just, you know, a brick wall, most brick walls don't have human scent on it. So any, any geocache really you can take them to. Yeah. That had a physical container, at least. Luke. Correct. Because someone has touched it. Because when you touch something, you, you, when you touch something, you leave behind skin. They're called, they're called skin rafts. Mm-hmm. You leave behind little pieces of your skin and your sweat. And that has bacteria in it. And it has a certain scent to it. Okay. okay. Um, so when I trained my dogs, when I trained my dogs, the only one that I trained the difference between a male and a female was my cadaver dog. Um, the rest of the dogs that I trained just for article and evidence recovery or geocaching, um, it didn't matter whether it was male or female. Okay. So if let's just say the geocache hadn't been found for three weeks, they're, they're still sent on it. It's just going to be more difficult for the dog to find it because it's a weaker scent. Right. That, that scent cone, that scent cone is not like this anymore it's like this it's a wider scent cone at the p at the point at the p at the point okay yeah it's like this because the wind has blown different directions um and i and it's and and then it just takes them a little bit more time to narrow it down okay so instead of having a pinpoint peak you've got a wider area yeah Yeah. so so if i'm looking for something that hasn't been found for say a year a geocache that hasn't been found for a year we may have to circle it because my dog might go in and cross and come back and then go in and cross and come back from it you know trying to catch the scent from a different direction and so we may have to go in circles and that's how i do that's kind of how i do um night caches now during the daytime Yes. So tell me about that because per an IM conversation you and I have had, <laughs> you recently found a night cache during the day, three night caches. Three of them. During the day. Well, actually four. Using your search and rescue skills. Yeah, fourth, because I just came, I just got back from the tippy top of Michigan um, on the west side of Michigan. Um, okay. We just found one yesterday, but the three of them that I found were back east. We went, we went back east to go find a whole bunch of a very popular geocache creator, his geocaches, and um, we just it, we were out too late. I mean, we're out. You know, I mean, you're out in the middle of nowhere, and it takes forever to get anywhere because you you take a road that's that's like five miles long and you shrink it up into a bunch of squiggly lines and it takes you an hour to get to the five miles, you know? Yeah. So it took us forever to get there. And I was like, look, I don't want to come back here again at, at nighttime, you know, and I you know, but I do this a lot. I, I do it a lot because I mean, I love night caches. I love night caches. They're fun. They're adventurous. But if you want a challenge, do it during the daytime. So, so how does this work? Because the night caches that I'm familiar with, you go out with a high-powered flashlight or torch, depending on the area you're from and what right. you call it, and you wave it around until you find reflectors or those little fire tacks or something. Right. So how do you do that during the daytime? It's a whole lot more difficult. <laughs> Everybody has ground zero, right? Y'all start right. at ground zero, Okay. And the fire attacks, the fire attacks are in the trees. Okay. So, and I don't use the dogs for night caching because fire attacks are all up in the trees. You know, they're, they're up higher. They're not down on the ground. They're not. So, um, anything that's up higher in the trees, the dogs aren't really going to smell unless there's a whole lot of scent up there. Now, if somebody puts a geocache up in a tree, that's a whole different story, but you, you can't do, you can't use the dogs for night. Camp. They're not going to find the fire tax. Until you get to the end. 
because okay. then you yeah. get the at the end they can find the article right. right unless someone has found well unless someone's found the night cache like recently then you could use a tracking dog because tracking dogs smell the ground where you've walked because you're you're constantly shedding skin rafts constantly you know so but i didn't i've never used the dog to find a night cache during the daytime either so but yeah so you, when you take off and you, you you know you you look at the you look at the fire tax and you see what they look like well now you've got to put your game face on because now you have to make sure um it's just like in search and rescue you have to look for evidence you have to you know you if you're out at a at a shooting you know you have to find a little tiny gun a little tiny um a cartridge in the grass you know so you look at it from different angles you look at it this way to see if the sun's setting you know sun's shining on it one direction you look you know you turn around and look backwards to see if it's you know there's a shadow or something that's how you look for footprints too you know you can see a footprint one way but then you turn around the other way with the sun shining um at a different angle you won't see it at all you know so now you really got to pay attention so yeah, at the beginning, everybody always has little fire attacks, so you figure out what they are. And this person had three, he had three night caches on the same darn road. Really? Yes. So this set of fire attacks was for this cache, and that set of fire attacks is for this cache, and this fire tax with this one was the other fire was the other cash and nobody had found them for a while so it took us uh, it took us all day to find all three of them were they at least like different colors or different numbers for the different associations if they were there, there uh were two sets there were two sets of fire tax there was red and there was white and then there was orange but the red ones were so old, they were orange. They looked orange, so yeah. Yeah, so. Mm. Wow. That one took a long time. It took quite a while. But yeah, I mean, you're going along. Like the one we just did uh, yesterday, we got to a point where the, the fire tax, there was, there was two orange fire tax and then a white one on the left. Well, that meant take a left, you know, turn left. Well, I'd never had anybody say turn left and the, and the trail turn left too. I've always, wow. I've always, yeah. I've always, when the tacks are there and you've got two tacks and one's on the left or one's on the right, you know, however they tell you to do it, you know. Yeah. If there's two fire tacks and they're going up and down, that means go straight. If they're going left and right, you know, that means you got to yeah. turn or whatever. But anyway, but um, th this one, it, it, told you to turn where the trail turned well there was a corner and the trail turned so we turned and we went down the hill and up the other side and it's like whoa wait a minute uh there's no track there's no tax here anymore <laughs> so, <laughs> you know i mean you get you get going down the trailways and you're like have you seen any no i haven't seen any uh, did you no I, I said you know if i seen any i'd have told you so that's when you always, you know, when you're doing man tracking, you always go with two people. So one person goes back to the last point known. So the last set of tacks. And then the other person gets in line, you know, stays out there and gets in line and they start making an arch back to you to, oh. find, to find a footprint. Well, for geocaching, you can't do that because the tacks are on this side of the trees. Right. So we both went back to the last known point and I stayed there or he stayed there, my husband. And then you start walking li like the dogs do, doing a zigzag path back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I'm like, well, it says go left. I don't understand. You know, it's, you know, and, and the trail goes left and that's what we've done. So I'm standing there and it goes left, it goes left, it goes left. Nope. Nope. There's nothing here. So I trade places with my husband. And I'm thinking I'm going because it says if you if you run out of tax, just keep going straight. Well, 
when you turn left, you go down the draw and up the other side, the, the trail turned hard right. I went straight. So I started going up in there. But my okay. husband was back here. So I started zigzagging up into the other side. And then my husband says, well, come back here. You know, I think there's something here. And so he had seen a little, a little tiny, just a little tiny trail going through the trees. It was a little, like a deer path. And then we started looking and sure enough, higher up in the tree. Now I'm only five foot two. So if it's above my head, that's why he's six, four. So <laughs> <laughs> if, it, if it's above my head, it's above my head. It doesn't exist. So higher up in this little tiny, tiny, skinny tree, about the, about the thickness of a 50 cent piece is two tacks with the right turn. Oh. After that tack with the left turn. So it was on the corner. So you turn and then you're supposed to make it, you know, turn this way and then turn that way immediately. You zigzag. So the two trees were only about three feet apart. You know, oh, wow. Just the width of the trail. And in between those two trees was a little tiny deer trail that you could barely see. I mean, if you're looking at it, but my husband says, well, it's got to be around here somewhere. And sure enough, it was higher up in the tree. So, but that's how, that's how we find them during the daytime is because you, you know, you, you take two people, one stays at the last known point and the other one just starts looking for trails or what might be a trail. And, you know, I mean, then, then, then you start leapfrogging, you know, you start leapfrogging. Okay. I got a tack here. Oh, I got tacks here. I'll turn here. Oh, poop where'd they go you know and then you come <laughs> back and you start okay you know i mean there was one it went along the trail and we were hiking along the trail and then it came to a four-way intersection i'm like whoa we're fi actually five-way intersection I'm like ah so he went down one i went up the other and it went, went i said there's you know we both came back and then we went the other way well before you got to that intersection we went back to the last point known and I walked up there and I said, huh, there's a little trail, a little, it was a little sand dune. And you could see where, you know, there was just about six inches wide. There was no weeds, you know, but the weeds had grown up over it. And I looked up and right there were the tacks that said turn right, right before that. Oh. Intersection. So that one took us, it was two tenths of a mile away from the car, but it took us across roads, across I mean, it, 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 it zigzagged all over the place on a, a mountain bike trail and then off across the road and then back across the road again, and then across the, the power line and then off into the trees. It probably took us about 30 minutes to go the two tenths of a mile. Okay. You know, we went that way ways, you know, the, all the zigzagging. Yeah. All the zigzagging and then backtracking and, you know, so, but it's fun. You know, um, and that's how the, the ones that were, the ones that were back East, they, um, they specifically said, they specifically said in the geocache description, do not attempt this during the daytime. Oh, don't tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why we did them in during the daytime. <laughs> so, but it was really funny. We found. We found the three night caches, but we couldn't find the one traditional. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> go figure. And then that's funny. And the CO, the CO, uh, he texted me and said, how did you find this night cache? Um, I was told that the laser, cause I guess you had to have a laser or something. I was told that the laser was broken. I said, yeah, we brought batteries, but we're at, we, we are out here during the daytime, so I have no idea what the laser was for. But yeah, your laser is broken, um, <laughs> but we didn't use it. And he's like, well, how did you find it? And I, I just explained to him. I said, well, we've taken man tracking classes. And so I'm standing there at this geocache container, you know, the ammo can. And my husband takes off and starts doing the curves going one way, just looking for trails. And I'm like, you know, that's a trail, but that's a goat trail on the side of the <laughs> But I took it anyway. And then when I just, I just kept 
I just, you know, kept looking to see what looked like a trail. I, I went down one and searched down there, came back, it went up, down another, you know, went up and then came back down. And, but it always brought me back down to this one spot. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going to go that way. I didn't want to go that way. And sure enough, there it was, you know, so it's just, and, and that's, I love it because one, it's something I love to do is geocaching. Yeah. And two, it hones your skills because you have to look for things that are out of the norm. It helps keep the search and rescue training relevant. Fresh. Yes. Yeah. Fresh. Yeah. So, but That's we don't, awesome. we don't look for, well, unless somebody has found it within the last 24 or 48 hours, we don't really look for footprints. If they've been there in the last 24 hours, we might look for footprints if, they, if it hasn't rained. And then kind of follow the footprints. But a lot of people, especially new people, they walk in circles within a five foot radius because they're, oh, the GPS points that way. Oh, now it's going this way. Oh, no, now it's going that way. And, you know, and it's like, oh, just put your GPS down and let it settle. And then, <laughs> well, and that's what I do. When my GPS is jumping all over the place, I will drop my backpack. I'll put my GPS on top where there's no, you know, I don't want to put it on a rock because you don't know if it's magnetic rock or, you know, or whatever. So I put it on top of my, my backpack and I'll let it settle. Then I'll head out, you know, 12 o'clock, two o'clock, you know, cause I search from 12 to one back and forth, then go to two, search from two to three, two to three and come back. Um, and then, but when I come back, I'll look to see where the GPS is settled down and pointing to, and then I go in that direction. Oh. Usually I find them, so. Okay. The last episode you were on, you mentioned a bit about using geocaching for navigation training with new people. Can you talk a bit more about that and how that works? <laughs> yeah. Um. People are, people are great when it comes to your cell phone, you know, and everybody's like, ah, I don't need to know how to use a map and a compass. And I got my cell phone and I was like, well, what happens when your cell phone dies? And, oh, well, you know, I know which way north is. Okay. Do you really? Okay. Which way is north right now? Cause I know which way north is, <laughs> you know, um, but if I go out in the woods and I get turned around and the cl and then the clouds are out, I have no idea which way north is. You know, I don't have an intern. I'm not a duck. <laughs> 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 so first we start. First I start about on map and compass. You know, and everybody needs to learn. How, everybody. My son. I was telling you, my son started geocaching when he was about two and a half years old, and. Uh, at two years old, at two and a half years old, I got him a compass and put it on a wristband for a watch. And, oh, okay. Um, he was my, I, I had two older kids, but they were 13 and 16. So it was kind of oh, okay. getting over. So I didn't have anything to do during the daytime, but teach my son, you know, and play with him, you know. So he learned really fast. We knew his ABCs by the time he was, you know, he went to preschool and they wanted to put him in with a five-year-old. So I'm like, he's three and a half he needs to learn how to share a toy he already knows <laughs> that you know he could read a compass so i taught him at two and a half years old i taught him okay so make the cut you know put turn the turn the turn your wrist and make the red line touch north touch the end okay and then i'd say okay make daddy go east and so he would hold it, hold, hold the compass where, you know, he'd hold his hand up on top of my husband's head where the, the needle stayed at the North. And then he would turn my husband's head by his ears and then kick Oof. him, go that way, daddy, go that way. <laughs> <laughs> so I figured if I could teach a three-year-old, I could teach a bunch of adults. So I started him out, you know, the basic map and compass which i guarantee you 90 percent of the geocachers don't know how to use a map and compass um but they should they should learn um it, if nothing else learn how to run a, a handheld compass because that could save you because a compass never runs out of batteries 
Right. So anyway, um, so I started out with Map and Compass and then then we bring in the, the GPS, you know, and, and use the GPS and teach them how to use GPS. And then, you know, they've got cell phones and you can use GPS on their cell phone and whatnot. Um, but then I, I would actually go out and hide geocaches for them to go find. And so first I'd, you know, okay, so here's the latitude and the longitude, you know, so I'd have like 10, 10 caches set out and they, you know, here's the latitude and longitude. You have to practice putting them into your GPS and, or, and or cell phone. Um, and then they'd go out and they'd find them. And I'd have, um, I have a big, huge Tupperware tote that has, um, search and rescue equipment in it that I, I went and bought like a P38 can opener, which is a pocket can opener or a fire starter or the, the wristbands that keep bugs off of you. Do anything geocache or not geocache, anything search and rescue related, the space blankets. I put those in the little boxes that I went and hid for the search and rescue people. And then when they got there, they got to take something out of my geocache that I placed for them. Okay. Then I would tell them, okay, well, here's the bait. You know, then I showed them geocaching.com and here's the basic membership. So I would find basic membership geocaches and say, okay, well, these four geocaches are what you have to go find before next month's meeting. Okay. And so I would, I would put a sticker on the lid or something, you know, and they'd have to come back and tell me what the sticker was. So, but what was really fun is when I took the G, the GPS and their cell phones away and told them now that they, now they have to find the geocache with a map and compass. Most people can't do it, but that's, I mean, but for the people that, for the people that did take the classes, they loved it because it gave them a reason to go out and practice their GPS skills and their compass skills, you know, and I have three or four, three or four, three or four caches that you have to project to, you know, when you're standing at this position, when you're standing here, you need to go like 220 degrees at like 50 paces or something like that, or 150 paces. And, and I, in search and rescue, I also taught them pacing too, because everybody's pace is different than the other. My legs are short, so one of my paces is only about a foot and a half. <laughs> my husband, he's six foot four. One of his paces, big difference, almost almost three feet, uh, three foot. Yeah. Three. So if I said you know two hundred and fifty paces, I'd be halfway there, and he'd be <laughs> if, he'd be beyond it. Yeah. Oh yeah, he'd be past it. You know. So that was so it, that was part of the uh, geocaching training too. So we'd have some. We had some projection classes um, using the, the compass and the GPS and stuff like that. So, but for the ones, for the people that stayed in search and rescue, they enjoyed it because it gave you a reason to get out and use your skills. That's why I still keep going out because I want to make sure that my skills are home for search and rescue. And what a better way to do it than geocaching and night caching during the day when somebody tells you, you can't do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's really interesting because for I would say probably ninety nine percent of geocachers, it's just a hobby, but for somebody in search and rescue, it's actually a practice as well. It's a needed skill. Yes, it it it's a needed skill, and you 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 have to keep your skills up. That's why you know I mean even with the dogs, you know I mean geo uh, search and rescue and geocaching. I write my geocaching when I like the night, the night caches that I found during the daytime. Mm -hmm. I wrote those down as uh, training hours because I, I was looking for what's not normal, you know? So I went out and I searched for, you know, little dots, you know, and I, and I wrote them down as training. I told you I was lazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's like evidence article training for you. For humans. And the dogs, depending on if you're using them or not. Correct. Correct. Yeah, but see, when you're out, when you're out doing a search for a human being, everything is evidence. A cigarette butt on the ground. Um, a wrapping paper. You know, I, and a lot of people, and unfortunately, litter. 
but they'll take a they'll take a granola bar and they'll rip off the corner and spit it out on the ground but they'll keep the wrapper because they're eating the granola bar you've got to be able to be confident enough to know that i can find that little tiny corner piece of that wrapper that's now tucked underneath a little tree limb on the ground in the search area where little johnny disappeared or joe the deer hunter went missing and didn't come back or the ginseng hunter you know um it's all you know it, it's all part of the training and when you train your eye to see details you're you're a whole lot better than some joe schmo and you say okay well what's the you know okay well there's a bank robbery what do you look like and you interview five different people you're going to get five different answers you know, you're going to get five different, totally different people, you know? So, but when, when you're in search and rescue, you need to, you need to train yourself to notice the little things. And when you're geocaching, you have to notice the little things. So when people talk about honing your geo senses, yours are like off the chart at this point. <laughs> yeah, you could say that. You, you could say that. Yeah, I can pretty much find anything unless it's on a rock cliff. You know, I mean, there's no, there's not much, there's not much you can do if somebody's, the, and that's the one that we didn't find, the three, the three night caches at the beginning of that road. There was a, 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 a boulder, a rock cliff down the side, and that's the one that we couldn't find. Oh, that's where the traditional was. That's where the traditional cliff. cache was, and we could we we couldn't find it. So nobody left me any clues. Darn it! <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> oh, but wow. Speaking of uh, map and compass use, um, you always want people to say their favorite their favorite cache. You know? Yes, the cash highlight. And you have one for us. The cash highlight was um, the one we just did. Um, we were on our way up to Michigan. And we stopped by, um, it's a town called, uh, it's in Wisconsin. <laughs> Wausau, W-A-U-S-A-U. Wausau? I, I got no clue. I'm I'm the last person to ask for pronunciation of things, to be honest with Especially you. Especially the further up you get up there. It's straight <laughs> up 39. I mean, we live right off of 39 down here in Illinois. It's straight up 39. You hit this little town called Woosaw, and then you go off to the west a little bit. It's GC299 uh, Bravo, so GC299B. It's called Worldwide Quarters. It is so cool. It is the biggest benchmark I've ever seen in my life. Okay. It's the benchmark. It's the benchmark of where, uh, the latitude and longitude of 45 degrees and 90 degrees intersect. And they've actually made it a, made a little park there. There's a virtual, the, vir the, the geocache says there's a virtual. Okay, and they've actually got okay. a little park there. You have to park outside this guy's cornfield. Okay, they've made a little parking area. Then they've made this cute little path along the edge of his cornfield. And then you go into the dead, almost the center of his, this guy's patch of corn. And there's this huge concrete thing with a bunch of plaques and everything. And in the middle of this concrete pad is a dinner size or steering wheel size benchmark of where 45 and 90 degrees meet on the map which is really cool so um they 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 put the map out there or they put a map out there that shows you where it intersects they've got uh the guy that first the guy that first found it um he started the 4590 club and this is why i like geocaching because um, a friend of mine, Jim, he's only been caching for a little while. I helped him get started in geocaching. Um, he got onto one of my, my Facebook pages and I, you know, I, I, I 
saw him on Facebook. He was asking questions and he's real newbie, you know, just started back in COVID time. And I told him, I said, get on my Facebook page and on my geocaching Facebook page and I will help you. And I got him started. The dude's almost caught up to me and he's only been geocaching for a couple of years. Wow. Um, he found this and he posted it on Facebook and then I saw it and I'm like, that's in my own backyard. I mean, that's not very far away, you know? So, um, we were supposed to, <laughs> we were supposed to go get chicken in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, cause there's a really good chicken place over there. And I told my husband, I said, honey, I said, there's two things. I said, we can get chicken anytime. We can run up there, you know, run up there in a day and come back. Or you can run up there, spend the night and come back. But you've got five days off. Um, there's this place that has this really huge benchmark out in the middle of a cornfield. And there's a trackable that somebody put on an island in the middle of a lake, out in the middle of nowhere, that hadn't been found, the, the cash hadn't been found for two years. I want to go rescue it before it gets stuck out there. It belongs to somebody in France. And so can we go up there? And But look at this. Look at this. The, the 4590. And not only that, when you're done getting the 4590, we get a benchmark token coin from the town. Um, so I showed him. He's like, okay, well, let's you know throw the kayaks in the back of the truck and let's go. So we went up there and we got the, we went to 4590 and I guess they don't, they don't have a welcome center anymore. So, um, your coin, your, your coin is free and it's, oh, it's probably about the size, well, bigger than a silver dollar. The, the coin is bigger than a silver dollar. It's two sided. Um, and you go, you, once you, once you go to the 4590 cash location, take your picture with a sign or with a benchmark and take it back to of all places the la quinta hotel on Stewart street <laughs> and you tell the dude behind the counter that you have just been out to 4590 and you need to sign their log because when you sign their log you become a member of the 4590 club and this club has been going on since like 19 something something way back way back Wow. And they give you this coin. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty awesome. That is pretty awesome. So great road trip. Great road trip up there. Lots of caches. Um, I'll tell you one thing. Whoever whoever put the caches out on uh, the peninsula at the top of Michigan up there, mm -hmm. I love them. 90% of them are regulars and larges. Oh, nice. Oh, they were so much fun. That's nice. Yeah, we we just finally found our very first large-sized geocache, and my kid was ecstatic. Yep. He thought that was so cool, because so many of them in our area are smalls yeah. or micros, and I've just gotten to the point where I don't even try to take him to micros nope. unless it's got a lot of favorite points for some reason. And then we'll go check out what's awesome about it, you know? Yeah. But so when he saw that large one, it was actually a, um, like one of the old newspaper dispensers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Somebody took that and made it a geocache. Yeah. And he thought that was the coolest thing. Well, Kitten, thank you so much for for coming on today and discussing this with us. This is fascinated me since we last <laughs> talked but it really has I have tried googling this topic and there is like nothing out there geocaching and search and rescue you there's know, like nothing out there maybe I should start a geocaching dog training class yeah I think it'd be <laughs> awesome I I found one small reference to a police department I think it was out in Oregon I'd have to look again. One small reference to them using it for navigation training yeah. for search and rescue. But even that little snippet was just like a couple of lines on their website. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, you, you would think it would go hand in hand. Yeah. You know. And there are probably other search and rescue members like yourself that geocache. But 
I just can't find anything. On my team, on my team, they had no idea what geocaching was. Really? Nobody knew what geocaching was on this team here. It just seems like, like you said, it would go hand in hand, and especially with yeah. the dogs and article training, it just seems like it fits so well. Oh, yeah. Geocaching is a fun way to hone my skills. Gives me a reason to get out. Um, it, it, it keeps me on my toes. You know, it keeps your brain working. You know, you're always looking. You know, you're always looking for one. You're always looking for a place to hide a cache. <laughs> Two, you're always looking for what's not normal here. You know, the little, the little things, the little things that don't really stand out to the, to the normal person. You know, I don't want to say normal person, but little things that don't stand out to the, just the Joe Schmo on the street. The average person. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they wouldn't notice, they wouldn't notice it. And boy, I tell you, knowing where the goat trails are or the rabbit trails are, or, you know, I mean, there's, there's been time, like I said, I'm five, two, my husband's six, four. I take the short route. Cause I go through the rabbit trails. He says a few naughty words and goes around. <laughs> <laughs> he finds another trail. <laughs> He's like, is there a way to get over there? Oh yeah. Go to your left. And then, Oh no, I meant go to your right, my left, your right. You know, <laughs> and then I, find, I bring him around the patch, you know? So, but it, it's always, it, it always makes for an adventure. It always makes for an adventure because you're always, you're always looking for things that, don't stand out to other people and you see a whole lot more, you know, I mean, you just, you just get to see a whole lot more and geocaching takes you to places that you wouldn't normally see anyway. Like that 4590 place. Who knew that that was, yeah, I didn't I'm going to have to look that up. Cause that that's awesome. You know? So, but yeah, I'm always, I'm always looking for a good adventure and go someplace and, you know, I, I may not end up at GZ because I might be off somewhere else looking at the foundation of an old house or I might find this or find, you know, but that's all part of the adventure. Adventure yeah. weeks out there, people. Go get it, you know. <laughs> it's not going to come to you on your couch, <laughs> you know. True. Go find it. It's fun. So, but yeah, um, I just, if people, if people would put the two together, it would also make search and rescue training more fun because a lot of people are like, Oh, you know, we got, we got to do map and compass today. We got, Oh, we got to do GPS training. Well, you know what? There's something at the end of the training. Yeah. You're not just going to a random point to navigate to. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, here's a, here's a point on the map. Go find it. You know, no, here are five different places that have something there. When you get there, open the something up or when you get there, there will be like, I'd put a, I'd put a sticker on a telephone pole or something, you know? And so they'd have to go tell me what the sticker was, but at the base of the telephone pole behind there was a little, um, a, a little geocache contained like a lock and lock box. Yeah. And it would have, you know, it, it would have geocaching equipment in it, you know, you know, so they could get something, but no, geocaching is fun. My, like I said, my youngest son is 24 now. He's been geocaching since he was two and a half years old. Um, he knows how to read a compass. He, he, knew, he knew how to identify footprints in the mud. I mean, how fun is it to take your three-year-old out and get in a mud pit and identify footprints and then make mud pies out of it? I mean, come on. <laughs> you know? And you can't get any better than that. Life is too good. Get out there, teach your kids, um, get them out to get them out to some good geocaches. You know, hunt for the larges and the regulars, and uh, check out the smalls and the and the micros before you go out. And then take your kid out and act like it's the first time you found it. Yeah, you know, so that way you don't disappoint the little hearts. So, but yeah, I mean, anytime. Anytime. Think of another subject I could talk about. Geo <laughs> I will work on that. <laughs> oh. Thank you again so much. I really appreciate it. All right. Talk to you soon. See you sooner, I hope. And uh, <laughs> be safe. Happy caching, everybody. You too. Thank you for listening to Geocache Adventures. I hope you enjoyed this episode. 
Have you heard of FTF Magazine? It's the magazine for geocachers, filled with articles and snippets sent in by geocachers just like you. I'm a subscriber myself, and I love it. Check them out today at ftfgeo.com and tell them Shadow Dragon 1 sent you. Would you like to be a guest on a show or have a topic you'd like to hear covered? Reach out and let me know. Just go to the geocacheadventures.org website and click on the contact page to reach out. (laughs) 